You're listening to Through Our Lens with the Disabled and Non-Disabled Alliance at Sacramento State, a club, organization, whatever, for disabled students, staff, and their allies to discuss and educate each other about disability-related topics, um, advocate on behalf of disabled students and the community, and to hang out together and just be a community. So we want to be more recognizable to Sac State. So please join the conversation by following and messaging us on Instagram at Dana at Sac State. It's D-A-N-A at Sac State. Hello all, this is Through Our Lens. My name is William White and I'm hosting this time. Guess whose problem that is? Brian's problem. Okay, uh, this uh, this episode goes out. Uh, it's the last one that's going to air before Juneteenth. The next one is June 20th, the day after June 19th. Uh, also, uh, I'm reliably and overwhelmingly informed uh, that it is Pride Month and also, also, uh, this is a podcast about disability. So given all that, I figured uh, to honor slash capitalize on all of that, uh, this would be a good chance for us to talk about like intersectionality, uh, generally and specifically, because that's what intersect, that's the deal. That's the, that's the beast we're working with. Um, basically what the model is, uh, what it means to people and, and to us in particular, um, how disability factors in and whatever else we want to talk about. My authority means nothing. I'm here with myself uh, and Brian Tao, our, our de facto producer, and Rian Dinzans, our, uh, uh, the founder of the Disabled non Alliance. Hello. I like how you said my last time, my last name this time, Dinzans. <laughs> Dinzans. At the stress on the A. That. Never heard that one before. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it now. <laughs> I've forgotten. <laughs> But yeah, like you know, thanks, thanks for thanks for being here, folks. This is one where uh, the the more perspectives that we've got, the better. Uh, except, of course, for like time considerations, I guess. Um, okay, um, to to start us off, um, I'm going to to uh, sketch a little bit, just auditorily, uh, about what I mean by intersectionality. Um, it's definitely something that is to be to be looked up and studied over over a long period of time. Um, but to to like start up start out the conversation, um, I, I can I can bring to bring to the fore a little bit of what what we mostly uh, sort of implicitly know about it already, just to make that explicit and and, and allow us to to have that in mind. Uh, so basically, intersectional theory uh, is designed after the observation that you can be oppressed or privileged in more than one way, um, along more than one vector, if you will. Um, the picture here that, I, that I'm imagining is of a, a network of walkways where you exist at some point on that walkway uh, and you are on the same path, the same straight line as you know, several other people who share some characteristic of yours uh, and several, a different line with several other People, etc., etc., etc. The problem with that analogy, of course, is that uh, the the walkways uh, uh, are basically infinite, uh, and it's all contextually relevant. It's all it's all the socially defined uh, classes and categories and so on, which change and morph uh, and and add to themselves over time. Uh, so, yeah, the, basically, the picture is you know uh, you have some standpoint in society. And that standpoint is one that exists along uh, at the intersection eh, of several vectors of, of oppression and privilege uh, in, in a particular social context at a particular time. So for example, uh, uh, if you are, let's say, uh, black, uh, intersex, and disabled for some, I don't know, whatever, uh, you exist by my conceit, uh, although there'd be more than three, three uh, intersecting vectors of oppression. You have historically sort of baggage uh, and, 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 and prejudices, uh, and maybe also good things like cultural capital uh, that come with being black in the United States. You have the inherent uh, sort of medicalization that comes with being intersex uh, in, some, in most contexts. That I know about, uh, which have been more properly covered elsewhere. I don't speak to that. Uh, <laughs> and, 
and uh, uh, you have the uh, benefits and drawbacks of whatever third category I said a second ago. Sorry, it's it's new, but we're all still waking up here. Uh, so yeah, uh, what that what that suggests is that you can be you can be oppressed and privileged in, in more than one way along more than one uh, uh, vector, and there's a unique sort of texture to not just each individual person's experience. That's true as well, but also to each kind of intersection, each each uh, uh, permutation of socially salient identities. Um, and, and that is going to, that informs like how we, how we think about these things. Um, my contention is in general, that as we have become a more, a more conscientious society, as we've become more aware of things like the, the historical material oppression of black Americans, et cetera, uh, intersectionality largely just contextualizes and makes real what we uh, sort of intuitively understand already, which is that there's this there's this uniqueness to each individual's experience, and that, that it has something to do with with social identities such as blackness and queerness, etc. Um, and the benefit of like the theory, then I I think is that, and this is like my call not to uh, not to do not to do anything more you know significant than like looking it up. Uh, the the harder the harder cells come later, but like had the benefits of having the theory in mind of having a more robust model than can be achieved by by that sort of intuitive sense of the thing that you get just by having conversations and having friends and different standpoints etc. Is that it can uh, uh, inform folks for those uh, those folks for whom uh, intersectionality is not intuitive, so people who come from uh, a standpoint that has lots of embedded privileges, maybe won't see the the uh, appeal of, of having an intersectional model in mind. But once it's laid out, it can be more easily uh, uh, persuaded towards. I say more easily. Um, <laughs> don't count on anything, and it's not your job to persuade everybody. But another thing is that it can more uh, the model itself, like the theory of intersectionality, can more deeply inform. Um, what we do and how, how we think about things, even for those of us for whom it is intuitive uh, or, or large parts of it are intuitive. Uh, a really good example would be something like disability. It's in a lot of circles, it's still natural to sort of leave disability out of the conversation or to uh, assume that disability is only uh, in the form of, of things like uh, strong sensory impairments, like total blindness, or strong mobility impairments, like being a, a, a wheelchair user, specifically with paraplegia. These are con these are you know not unheard of disabilities. These are not these are not not real disabilities. But it would not be a complete picture of disability to limit your consideration to them. And I think as we've seen in previous meetings of the, the disabled non disabled alliance, previous podcast sessions, etc., it's really common, uh, and especially in policy making, to just leave out disability altogether or to, to assume that it's accounted for by some other system like the ADA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so having like intersectionality in mind can help inform praxis at that level uh, just by way of being a more generally applicable theory and more explicit than the sort of intuitive side of things. That's, that's me saying, you know, go elsewhere, learn about intersectionality. It's a life's work, but it's really good. Um, and uh, with that sort of in mind, um, then I, I sort of want to to uh, get as many takes as I can as uh, on this kind of thing, uh, because it's achieved by by like sharing ideas and stuff. Okay, um, so, so your, yeah, your what prelude is, there got my brain working finally, nice. and I had a thought. Um, when it comes to how disability circles and queer circles interact. There's a huge overlap, by the way, between queerness and disability. I think partially because inherently the two identities are just so incompatible with the current norms of society. Like, depending on your disability, the way you present your gender, for example, could be completely different than what's considered normal and therefore it overlaps with queerness. Um, but my point specifically being in terms of policy, 
ever since Oberfell versus Hodges, where, you know, the um, gay marriage, you know, good stuff legalized, uh, happy pride. Um, ever since then, I've, I've heard people say stuff like, oh, everybody can marry whoever they want now. But that is not the case, because disabled people still do not have true marriage equality. Yes, we can marry, but not without a multitude of um, consequences that come directly from the government, like losing your uh, uh, government aid that for many people is, you know, crucial to continuing to live their lives. Like, they simply do not make enough money with the jobs they might be able to get in order to pay for all their medical expenses, for example. And so they have to choose between being with the person they love, but risking not being able to make it and ensuring that they're able to make it, but not being able to be with the person they love. And that extends to people who are living as if they were married as well. So you don't have to be officially married to lose your benefits. If you are cohabiting with someone, for example, that can also be used against you. Um, and it's not really talked about. Uh, and it's a little off-putting because um, I'm, I'm both very queer and very disabled and it's a little off-putting to to go into queer circles and have everyone talk about how they're so thankful that everyone in their community can get married now and then you know turn back to the disabled circle and be like are you hearing this shit you know it's like it's it's not the case that everyone can get married now and you know gay marriage is a huge um still a huge victory, especially considering the rising um, animosity against queer people. But, you know, it's not everything. There's still a lot more work left to do. And because it's not talked about, because disability is not talked about, and that marriage inequality is not talked about, it feels like people are just becoming complacent with that marriage inequality because they don't, it's not talked about, so they don't know about it. So there's no political action to fix it. And that's where it gets pretty messy. That's why talking about these things matters because otherwise it just goes under the radar and, you know, nothing gets fixed on a fundamental governmental level. Yeah. It's, I mean, you, you'd almost think that like, um, uh, same-sex marriage was was not the end goal of the things like the civil rights movement, etc., <laughs> or at least not the proper end goal, uh, such that you know when it was achieved, the rest would follow. Uh, yeah, like yeah, and 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 one thing that occurs to me as well, like just on the on the intersection of like uh, disability and and queerness, is you might have like from a strictly you know medical standpoint, you could have like a disability and you know, uh, um, uh, like gender affirming, like medical procedures that you want to go through that kind of exist in tension with one another in some sense. Yeah, um, that's that another make, huge like, problem. Affair much more difficult. Yeah. That's another huge problem. Like doctors may not take us our desire for a transition um, seriously if we're disabled. They will look at us and say, well, what's the point, right? Or they'll say, oh, that procedure is too complicated. Or it could literally put your health at risk because your disability makes it so that going under or a major surgery can risk your life. And, you know, and then there's people that look at disabled people and automatically think that none of us can fuck. And, like, I don't know what to tell you, man. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I might be on the A spectrum. I don't know. But, like, there are quite a lot of disabled people that are very, very, very horny and also very gay. So I don't know what to tell you there. <laughs> and, and, and where these things intersect with, with, like, race as well is that there's, like, there's oftentimes uh, historically inherited, you know, economic disadvantages that come along with, with being of a particular race. 
almost regardless of like which racial category that is. I mean, you, you, uh, uh, I contend it would be it would be a separate separate discussion maybe, but like I contend that that whiteness is a race in today's society, it, not marginalized, but it is racialized in some sense. Um, and so like it still has that privilege, but if you're uh, if you're Latinx or, or black, for example, you probably have uh, less inherited wealth than and than any you know the average white family, uh, and so there's less likelihood that you'll have the right like support system if you go through all the all the medical mumbo jumbo that you that is associated with being uh, either quite disabled or or, or you know a, a queer in a particular way or both, um, and that's that can make the experience even more difficult. Uh, yeah, and, and if uh, if in if somehow uh, uh, all of those things do obtain, but you are of such if you come from like the the upper class, uh, that can be significantly easier in some ways, but not in all ways. You'll still face the sort of the social stigmatization uh, that comes with all of those factors as well. Um, so yeah, like these are these are these become sort of important things to keep in mind. Uh, where and and I guess. For, for, for my perspective, it looks a lot like uh, intersectionality is a really good thing to keep in mind as an explicitly like sociological model because it calls to it calls for looking for those other vectors uh, in, some, in some ways. So like uh, if, if I, I, I wouldn't be satisfied with knowing something like uh, uh, you know racial characteristics or, or like racial categorization, which is technically arbitrary, but there you go. and uh, uh, you know disability status. Because I would know, well, okay, but there are always other, other interests, other other vectors that factor into the intersection, um, and and I would know to look for those, and, and that would be that would inform uh, my like picture of some of some somebody's experience or or some uh, maybe lacuna in the public policy, etc. Um, sorry, I've been talking for. <laughs> I mean, you said you were hosting, didn't you? <laughs> I said it was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I guess um, I kind of want to bring a transportation policy aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I, I work for a Caltrans Office of Race and Equity, and they consider, I guess, intersectionality um, equity for all kinds of people. So I guess like the government really like cares about like equity, intersectionality, and that's like a big change uh, because this is a new like um, new like department uh, like since twenty eighteen. And it's nice to see that state departments and like the federal government and like state governments like care about like all kinds of people and they want to improve like public transit for um, I guess less fortunate people, people of color and like disabled people. I had two more thoughts. Um, I'm going to say them a basic version of them now so you guys can help me remember when I talk about one and eventually forget the other. Um, one identity politics to cops. I'm going to start with cops. Um, I do want to point out that the while the government has improved in some ways from considering different experiences that you can have with the different uh, factors you identify with, especially in the case of cops, though, it's incredibly messy and quite frankly terrifying um because there is already a huge issue with cops judging black americans at a first glance based on the color of their skin and you know sometimes they might not even realize it it's unconscious bias they were trained to think that black people are you know inherently prone to crime or some stupid shit like that Right. Um, or it might be on purpose. And you never know, considering the amount of white supremacists that are cops. But regardless of that point, the fact of the matter stands is that unless you are absolutely on top of your game mentally and are able to communicate effectively and control your emotions, you're going to struggle with interactions with cops if you're black. And and even then, if you do everything right, you still might get shot, which is, you know, the whole reason why we had the Black Lives Matter movement and why people are still protesting these things because it hasn't been solved. But 
my point being that if you are not on top of your game like that, like if you have a disability that affects how you communicate with people, that affects your emotional or sensory regulation, you know, it's going to get messy really fast because it's not like you walk around life with a big banner over your head saying, I'm deaf, I'm autistic, I have schizophrenia or something like that, you know? You, you don't, these things are obvious. I mean, that's the whole point of the term invisible disabilities, but these things aren't typically obvious on a first glance. And in the eyes of a cop, any weird behavior that would normally indicate to a normal person that you have some sort of disability that's impacting the way you communicate or the way you are, you know, interpreting the situation. To any other person, they'd be like, oh, you know, they're, they're probably dealing with something, some sort of disability. I don't know. I'll just be patient with them. To a cop, those are indicators of an active threat and noncompliance. And they will shoot because that's what they're trained to do. It makes it incredibly deadly. And that's a point where both the social aspect and the political aspect come into play is come into play in terrifying ways. Because, you know, if you're a deaf, a deaf black person and you're driving your car and you get pulled over, you know, you see the flashing lights, you pull over for the cop and the car cop starts talking at you what are you going to do? Like, you can't reach over to grab a notepad because they'll see that as you reaching for a gun. If you pull out your phone, they're probably going to start yelling at you and demand you put the window down. If you try to, you know, sign I'm deaf, they'll see, they'll see that and think, oh, that's a gang sign. You're a gang member, right? There's no escape because there was no flexibility or understanding of disability in the realm of blackness trained for the cops. They see you, a black disabled person, and they think threat. They don't think a disabled person, right? They think threat, especially because of those two traits combined. Like I can say as a white disabled person, you know, I do know that there is a factor that comes into play with my disability interactions with cops that does put me at slightly more risk than the average white person. But I have a huge advantage specifically because I'm white. They're not gonna look at me and think criminal. They're gonna look at me and think, oh, poor little disabled person in their poor little wheelchair, right? Like I'm not gonna get the same uh, sort of judgment that a black disabled person would get. And that is so incredibly fucked up and something we could fix with policy if we integrated that intersectionality within policy. The question of how to how best to do that is years and years and years in the making for me specifically and still nowhere near done. Um, I tend to Okay, this is not this is not this is, this episode isn't about isn't about cops and I or not primarily uh, and and I I this is it's I know I, I just hate cops and it reminded me of it so I went on for a bit there know. but yeah what I mean is like like for me it's the wrong forum to go to launch into something however um, I did I tend to say something along the lines of if our society is arranged in such a way that all our responses to problems uh, are you know uh, reactionary or or interventionist. Um, as opposed to centering uh, in our policy the prevention of problems from arising in the first place uh, by way of having fewer people be forced uh, be, to turn to the alternative market and therefore and thereby you know make themselves uh, into criminals by necessity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, then you know uh, uh, then there will be more and, and worse. Uh, instances of of like police violence and police brutality and so, and, and so on, just because and, and they will be you know distributed um, <laughs> they will be distributed inequitably uh, because of those like historical material factors etc. Uh, and I keep saying etc. because there's just there's just so much yeah, so is much. the problem. <laughs> but sorry, yeah, uh, 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 Brian, if you had something, I don't I don't want to step over you. Yeah, you were going to talk about policy. Sorry, oh, I, 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 there. I mean, I did talk about transportation policies. Like, that's it. But, like, I do agree. Like, 
I guess like governments still need to work better. They may have this like specific specific department for like equity, but it could be better to kind of like kind of like, like the way you're saying like, in cops that they need like add more training with disabled people. And I guess you can move on to your first point, right? Your first point is identity issues, right? And oh yes, identity politics. Okay. Um, it occurred to me. I, I have like a little mini Republican version of me in my head that whispers in the back of my mind sometimes and not because I identify with it, but more because I live with Republicans. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, the, the little tiny voice in my mind was saying, wow, you're all bitching about all these identities and you think you're so special snowflakes. What does this have to do with anything? You're just playing identity politics. It's totally useless. And to counter that, to counter anyone who may be thinking that while listening to this podcast, although I, I don't know why you're listening to this podcast, if you're that against, I, I, never mind. But um, I can subscribe, Ben Shapiro. Do it. If you, <laughs> Wait, no, you're if you hold the opinion that us talking about intersectionality is equivalent to that very useless, petty brand of identity politics where diversity win the class trader is gay, you know, um, that's not the point. You're missing the entire point of this conversation because this is about how people's lived experiences are shaped and shape the, size, the society around us, the government that, you know, presides over our daily livings and what's considered legal and illegal, you know, those things they do matter and your identity does come into play quite frequently, especially if you're a minority. This isn't us just whining and bitching about these things. It's us pointing out the fact that these things can be changed on a much more fundamental level um, politically for the better if we consider you know, the true realities of living as a uh, person from a minority, marginalized group, you know, um, it's not diversity group, when sure. the class trader is gay, it's, you know, bring down all the oppressive systems and build something better in its place be by considering all these different lived experiences. One thing I think about as well, uh, is that like to to the benefit of Republicans, they they oftentimes find or like maybe uh, you know liberals in the sense of being capitalist, which encompasses both Democrats and Republicans for the most part. Uh, there's a lot of intersectionality that benefits them as well. Uh, for example, you have characters like like Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris who are extraordinarily capitalist, uh, ex rather extraordinarily like establishmentarian in terms of the, the powers that be, despite that the, their existence on, on a, they, the sort of intersectionality uh, framework as being women, and in Kamala Harris's case as being a racialized woman uh, for, for, most, for her entire life uh, and in most contexts. Um, because if we wanted to explain that, uh, and and, and we, we, if we wanted to really properly explain it, we'd have to, I'd have to have a more uh, detailed uh, account of their sort of life stories. But from my understanding, they exist also uh, at, at, uh, on a vector of uh, wealth privilege, like wealth uh, coming from and, and having lots of experience with uh, having, having lots of wealth uh, and, and, and uh, privileges associated with that uh, from early on, uh, if not based on their own careers, but then based on their family's careers, et cetera. Um, and part of what that means is that they're, they're inherently uh, uh, more incentivized, not, which is not to say that, that you can't have like wealthy class traders, you can, um, but they're sort of more incentivized to, to cater to the uh, power structures that are because those power structures, despite their status as women, despite Kamala Harris's status as being a, a woman of color, um, those power structures have uh, benefited them significantly. Um, put them in places, positions of power, for one thing, uh, and so that kind of explains for for the to the again to the benefit of conservatives why those two characters, despite being you know Democrats, are are highly supportive 
of the power structures to which conservatives uh, adhere, uh, you know, ideologically. <laughs> and that's important to keep in mind for, obviously, that's important to keep in mind in general, but that's important to keep in mind if you have a, a, a more anti-capitalist agenda as well, because what it means is that you, you there is uh, more than more than the sort of superficial stuff to take into account when when evaluating like a politician's standpoint in society. Um, and that becomes very important because those politicians and then uh, often by by organizations in the so-called like mainstream media, I don't want to, you know, uh, fear monger about it or anything, but it is easy to like tout characters like uh, Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris, et cetera, um, as as being representative of, of, of new perspectives. And so, you know, if they support the, 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 uh, the capitalist class system, then the clap, the, it must be fine. Like that's, <laughs> um, this, the, the idea, the, the rhetorical trick is to say, you know, these two people belong to my historically marginalized groups. And that's true. Uh, therefore they represent better policy or, 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 you know, Barack Obama represents a win for, you know, racial justice. Uh, just in and of himself, just by just by way of his existing in the office for a long time, uh, because of of his of his identity. Uh, but intersectionality calls to calls us to take into account more things about those characters and 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 uh, more evaluate their positions and their standpoints in society in a more nuanced way. And that's that's very useful if you want to actually get out of politicians the policies that you want. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's that's sorry. That's one thing I've been thinking of. The, the sort of identity politics is often sort of turned on the the politicians in a in a in a in a weird way, and it always it always sat wrong with me, uh, just at the intuitive level. And it's only like after learning a little bit more about that sort of the the theory of intersectionality um, and and the, you know historical material conditions that factor into it uh, that it became more clear like why those politicians who belong to marginalized groups, then don't do, you know, anti, anti marginalization as their, as their platforms. Uh, yeah, uh, but we can start discussing, I guess, um, maybe personal praxis is something that that's worth like talking about a little bit, like how, how intersectionality should, or how like no understanding intersectionality ought to, or, or naturally does like impact the way we just interact with each other on a sort of everyday interpersonal basis. Um, I'm, that's, that's an area I'm still kind of figuring out, um, if I, if there's anything to, to figure out per se, and not just like learn through experience. Yeah. Like for me, I'm still kind of learning what intersectionality is. So like all of this is kind of new, but I guess like as people, we should take into account of like everyone's like experiences, like not one, like disabled person will have the same experiences or will have the same like disability. Um, like I think. I think uh, when we were doing like presentations on like advertising um, the disabled and non-disabled alliance with Reonomy, uh, we were talking about like how all disabled people are not like the same. Like um, for example, if you need help, um, not all disabled people will ask for that help. Maybe that they're, they're learning on how to like, for example, like open a door. Maybe like people think that they're struggling because they're disabled opening a door, but they're actually just working on it kind of slow because like some disabled people are slower than the able-bodied people like me um so i guess we should take into account like everyone's like disadvantage in some ways but not the same ways that the spirit of that right it's totally there the the um, ability of being like multi or the uh the fact of being like multiply uh oppressed or existing on, on an intersection of vectors of the, of oppression and privilege uh so yeah, uh, people people can and uh, you know struggle with things in like in like textured ways that are they're not. I I think a lot of of, of good can come of uh, intersectionality in the sort of intrapersonal sense as well. Uh, that's 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 kind of my experience of the thing where I start to more cleanly integrate into my own personal narrative, my concept of self. Uh, the, the the actual sort of facts of my existence, the 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 um, the ways in which uh, the privilege of being like white white and middle class and, and a man and stuff uh, have factored into the 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 impact that my disability has had on me growing up. Um, 
I can sort of, if I can contextualize that in a, in a, in a society, I have a better and more, more nuanced um, idea of where I fit into that society. And that's, that's kind of an inherent good. I don't know if that uh, is, is the kind of thing that's instrumentally good. It probably is uh, in, in, way, in ways that, that, are, that are harder for me to cash out just in this moment. But it definitely feels better just to, just to have the, a more fleshed out and more, more robust personal narrative of, of oneself. Um, and if in the same breath, like we can, we can help other people uh, get closer to that, have that, have that richer experience of self and, and place in society uh, and like standpoint, then maybe that's something that, that informs our sort of our interpersonal practice as well, where we decide affirmatively to have conversations centering intersectionality or, or dissecting uh, and, and, and trying and interrogating like where one stands uh, relative to those, those many vectors of, of oppression and privilege. Um, so as to build the, that better concept. Uh, that yeah, can be, uh, I don't know, an enriching interpersonal experience. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, um, I guess we should bring into like professors, like intersectionality. Like, do you think they think of, I guess their students like in this intersectionality um, like mindset? Yeah. Like most professors are like, what do you think? Probably not. I'd like to be more charitable with it, but my my experience of professors, as good as it overall is, and I and I think I take it to be a have a, you know a more pleasant experience than most people have, especially given yeah. the look on Rihanna's face a second ago. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I definitely have not seen uh, uh, professors as as, as uh, consistently taking into account the the various. Intersection. And it's not clear how they would do that anyway, to, in my mind, mm-hmm. um, in the context of a classroom. But it is true that, like, you know, for disability specifically, as we talked about, like, professors don't always get it right. Um, and some, it, maybe that part of that is to be understood, like, by where they stand in the, in the, uh, on the many vectors of oppression and privilege, being of an older generation for the most part, uh, with, with a, a greater, uh, the greater accumulation of, of like and, and greater inheritance of wealth that comes with uh, having come up in a time that's that was more economically prosperous or, or you know less late capitalism etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, there's something there and and and, and uh, but basically no but I'm not entirely certain how they could do it do it better just in the moment um, probably there's plenty of policy suggestions we could make and should make <laughs> I don't want to take too much time. If I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure acknowledging the intersection of different identities is part of the policy at Sac State for professors. I'm, I'm, I've seen that around a lot, and I don't know if that's just for my major or like for the whole school. But um, when they do bring it up, to me personally, it's kind of obvious whether or not they think about it because the way they present it kind of gives it away. <laughs> you can kind of tell they don't think about it as much um, when it feels like shoehorned into the class and they give a very, very basic um, view of it. And then you can tell when they do think about it a lot and do consider it as a part like a true part of their curriculum when it's brought up over and over again but in a way where it adds to the conversation and they make a really great point with it and um they go much deeper than the surface level and brings up different specific examples of how uh, intersectionality can come into play. And I feel like I kind of have the advantage in um, making that observation because, you know, child development major, there's like a whole bunch of different stuff we have to think and talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, And also I, I took some classes that were like that for fun because 
it seemed interesting but mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i personally i can kind of tell when they when they can take intersectionality into consideration you know in terms of teaching their curriculum in terms of how they see their students i don't know i'm not that good at social stuff to be able to tell but um I, I do know that some teachers are much more familiar with the concept than others. Yeah. Um, that is something I have noticed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've noticed that, like, I, I guess the, with, like, their emails at the end thing, like, they always, like, talk about their pronoun, he, him, or she, his, or she, she, hers, they, them. Yeah, but... Completely mix and match. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think, I think, like, they care more about intersectionality if they mention their pronoun and like they're like in a no but like if professors are like a little older and like don't acknowledge like pronouns then they're probably like not the most familiar with it and it also depends on like the class subject anyways like uh, if it's like a child like development major or like philosophy um they're gonna be more like involved into like this intersectionality to like that kind of like mindset but um for like engineering mathematics professors Maybe not. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, because like the intersectionality stuff, because it's so tied to like social relations and societal relations and cultural relations, uh, you know, we have covered many times about um how those different identities can affect your development growing up. Or at least I've thought it about uh, I've thought about it a lot, but um <laughs> But, you know, that is a very important topic within my major, uh, personally, I think. But, you know, with, with engineering, I think it's more like, is this AI I've created going to be racist? You know, <laughs> yeah. you gotta think about that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm more like, I know for engineering, like civil engineering, like I, I took the intro class because one out, um, basically, um, like they have a good like aspect on like equity making sure that it's like um i guess like equitable but they don't have like a thing like on intersectionality like how like a bridges affect like inter intersectionality or like a new like building affects like intersectionality um i guess like civil engineering like transportation plan transportation engineers like don't really focus on that but like city planners transportation planners like are more focused on that so um maybe like in civil engineering, they should have a focus on like intersectionality, just to kind of like bring that up instead of just focusing on like equity by itself. Yeah, I feel with like with majors like that, where how intersectionality relates, we're saying intersectionality a lot, um, <laughs> with how it relates to the major, um, where it's not immediately obvious. I, I feel like people don't think about it because it's not obvious mm -hmm. in those majors, but I do still feel like it is relevant on some level. You just need to stop and think about it for a good long while. Like, yeah. I don't know, an hour. An hour. <laughs> like, <laughs> like just for starters, you know, and then and then take it from there. But you mm -hmm. know, once you make that first crack and how does this relate to what I'm doing, eventually you know over time more and more comes out of that crack and then eventually you realize oh it's all connected you know but you have to you have to make that crack at it first you have to take that crack and you have to to think about it and i feel like certain majors don't think about it because it's not immediately obvious you know yeah i, I think especially like so uh, like cs majors computer like science majors like they're not focusing that at all but like, i know like civil engineering is because it affects like civil engineering is like a little bit because buildings affect everyone. There's a, a lot of a lot of really like easy stumbling blocks, right? In 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 um, in subject areas that are not directly focused on on intersectionality, like uh, for its own sake, in the in the way that like sociology is and and and, and you know deeply sociology embedded uh, fields. So for for a uh, if somebody if somebody is going into to engineering right as as a major or just or even as uh, a as a as a, oh, a class as, a, as maybe even as a passion project or something um, the 
the incentive to to think intersectionally, to think about intersectionality, uh, is minimal to non-existent. Like for the for the person in that situation, uh, absence the the you know already built up framework for intersectionality and social social sociological imagination uh, and so on. For as much as I'm sure many uh, pre-college pedagogues try to embed that kind of thing into people's minds. Um, the, the, the incentive is just, is just very minimal, uh, sort of in the same way as it's been observed that the people who work for, for you know, work in, in, in one uh, disabil- you know, disability serving like government department or something like SSI won't necessarily tell you or won't necessarily know anything about other you know, support services because that's just not their job. We currently live in a, in a society where in, in the broadest way possible, nobody's really supposed to, nobody really, nobody is, is, is taught uh, uh, that, that it's right and, and, and good and only acceptable to like have a holistic picture of society in mind. Um, we are taught for the most part growing up uh, that you do your job basically and you get through it uh, and you don't have responsibilities like outside of what somebody is paying you for, what somebody uh, whom you love needs from you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so if you don't, if you don't have that in mind and you don't have a direct like reason uh, for, for, ha- for, you know, having intersectionality in mind during the course of like an engineering project, most people will not have it in mind. Just as a matter of like how we've articulated at the societal level, our, our psychology, like this, the, the hermeneutic in which we are working has this lacuna, like we don't, take we don't we don't think we need to take uh, intersectionality into account by way of not needing to take anything into account that isn't something somebody is incentivizing us to do uh so yeah like that's that's an encouragement i will i will you know throw it to the audience as well like you are beneficent you you are loved and you love other people and part of how you cash that out part of how anybody should cash that out is by taking you know, uh, by taking into account where people really stand in society um, and then using that in, in all your fields because they all have an impact there. Um, so, yeah, um, I guess because I'm hosting this episode, I'll say something by way of outro uh, real quick. Um, <laughs> thank you for tuning in. Uh, 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 I don't know why we still say tuning in. The, uh, the links are in the description. Uh, Dana is still happening. Uh, we are good at podcasting. um, where is the ramp hashtag where is the ramp ramp. (laughs) next episode i believe will be airing on on again june 20th uh and and it'll be on accessible technology which is going to be fun stuff okay Uh, yeah thank you all and have an intersectional day (laughs) (laughs) not that you can help it (laughs) all right bye you're listening to Through Our Lens with the Disabled and Non-Disabled Alliance at Sacramento State, a club, organization, whatever, for disabled students, staff, and their allies to discuss and educate each other about disability-related topics, um, advocate on behalf of disabled students and the community, and to hang out together and just be a community. So we want to be more recognized multi state. So please join the conversation by following and messaging us on Instagram at Dana at Sac State. It's D-A-N-A at Sac State.